So I'm going to introduce the speakers, but I just wanted to say a few words first. And, and um, first of all, it's very exciting to um, be able to participate in this event uh, with the two of you. Um, as I was saying to uh, you guys a minute ago, uh, I think that there's a lot of um, aspects of, of what each of you do which are very resonant here. Um, you know, the, the, the kind of teaching that we do, the is issues in questions of uh, environment, issues in the questions of the relationship between architecture and the elements of architecture, and uh, uh, the kind of performative questions that we are engaged with um, necessarily at this, at this period in time are critical. And I think both of you each address those issues in different, very different ways, obviously. Um, Kiel's work uh, as a uh, writer and an architect, I think, bridging between kind of questions of research about architectural performance uh, and the questions of energy in particular, and the way that that gets translated into um, some of the built works that he does. And in Mark's case, the, the, the question of the, um, the specialization in facade engineering, facade consulting with the world's leading architects, um, and the way that that brings up issues, again, of performance, but also of the, the uh, way in which uh, the facade of a building the, uh, speaks to larger questions of architecture are really, really critical issues. And I think that, so we're, I'm really looking forward to this discussion and the way that it can inform um, the pedagogical concerns that we have in the school that are very pertinent to, to the work that you each have. Uh, each you do, I should say. Um, So, um, Kiel Mo is a registered practicing architect and associate professor of architecture and energy at the Department of Architecture at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. At Harvard, Kiel teaches introductory, comprehensive, and option design studios in addition to thesis. His primary lecture and seminar courses are entitled Forms of Energy and Non-Modern Architecture. He's published several books um, among others, Empire, State, and Building, Insulating Modernism, Isolated and Non-Isolated Thermodynamics in Architecture, Convergence, an Architectural Agenda for Energy, and Thermally Active Surfaces in Architecture. He's currently completing What is Energy and How Else Might We Think About It with Sanford Quinter, by, uh, to be published by Actor. Um, and it uh, says here 2016, but I guess that's uh, still upcoming. Um, and Wood Urbanism from the Molecular to the Territorial with Jane Hutton and Daniel Ibanez. In recognition of his design practice um, and research endeavors, he has received numerous awards and honors, including the 2016 Fulbright Distinguished Chair in Helsinki, Finland, the 2010 uh, Gorman P. Stevens Rome Prize Fellow in Architecture, the 2013 Boston Design Biennial Award, the 2011 Architecture League of New York Prize, and the 2011 AIA National Young Architect Award. Keel received his BArch from the University of Cincinnati and his MArch from the University of Virginia, and his MDes in Design and Environmental Studies from Harvard University Graduate School of Design. Trained in a co-op school of architecture, he learned uh, most about architecture by working as a, as a custodian at the Salk Institute for Biological Sciences. So I'm going to introduce both our speakers. So the format that we're going to do is uh, roughly 20 minutes for each speaker and then a 20 minute moderated discussion and then we'll open it up um, to uh, discussion and, and uh, further discussion uh, with the audience. Uh, so as to Mark. Mark Simmons is a founding partner of the specialist facade consulting practice Front Incorporated and has collaborated with many of the most prominent architects in the world today, producing some of the most exciting facades in, con in the contemporary world of architecture. Frequently, buildings are recognized much more by their facades than their interior or exterior spatial qualities, and this highlights the obvious role of the facade beyond its purpose to keep out the elements of nature. As Mark uh, puts it, Beyond its functional role, the facade is a signifier that evokes thoughts about what the building is all about. Front is a cross-disciplinary group of creative individuals with professional backgrounds in architecture, structural engineering, and mechanical engineering. The firm provides design and technical consulting services through extensive collaborations uh, to realize innovative projects and responsible design. 
Front has been involved in a series of innovative projects including the Seattle Library, CCTV, Musée, Musée National des Beaux-Arts uh, de Québec by OMA, uh, Grace Farms and Toledo Museum by SANA, Niarcos Foundation National Library and Greek National Opera and Morgan Library by Renzo Piano Building Workshop, uh, Pellerman Center for Performing Arts at the World Trade Center, uh, Wiley Theater and, Va and Vaco with Rex, Paris Art Museum uh, and Walker Art Center with Herzog and Dumeron, and the nearly complete Canadian House of Commons at the West Block in Parliament Hill with Fournier Gersowitz, Gersowitz and Mostrelet Architect and Architecture 49. Recently, Mark Simmons spent nearly uh, spent five years as the Thomas W. Ventulet, third, the third distinguished, distinguished chair in architecture at, and design at Georgia Institute of Technology, leading an advanced graduate design studio. Prior to that, he was a faculty member for six years at the Princeton University School of Architecture. Mark holds degrees uh, from the University of Waterloo, Bachelor of Environmental Studies, and a Bachelor of Architecture degree. Uh, his specialist facade knowledge and experience in custom curtain wall and hybrid cladding systems design is built upon previous work at Foster and Partners, Meinhardt Facade Technology, and the Structural Glass and Facade Consulting Group at Dewhurst McFarland and Partners in New York. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Kiel to start. Right, thank you, John. Um, well, thank you for inviting me to uh, your school, um, and I've been very much looking forward to this conversation with Mark and all of you this evening. Um, I'll start back with the prompt that Anne spoke about earlier, um, which began with the overall uh, thematic of questioning the canon, which is absolutely one of my favorite sports in architecture, and so I'm very happy to participate in this series in particular. But more specifically, my hosts inquired um, in a world of unprecedented possibilities and unforeseen brutalities, what can architectural education do? And before I share my perhaps blunt thoughts on this important question, as a non-modernist, I'd like to remind us that the modernist technological determinist structure of this question overlooks that all too often ours is a world in which unprecedented possibilities, such as the relationship between, say, Twitter and maybe the Arab Spring, offers us certain things, certain possibilities to us. Uh, but these same possibilities tend to become unforeseen as well as totally foreseeable brutalities, such as the relationship between Twitter and the brutalities that make something um, like Twitter little more than a form of cruel enthusiasm. So in this context, uh, my host asked, what can we do, uh, what can architectural education do? Um, but moreover, I would add, what is it obligated to do uh, in these types of circumstances? My primary reply to these prompts is that we finally and fully conceptualize architecture in all of its possibilities and brutalities as the open system that it is. I say this because the canon of architecture as we have received it was codified in a very different earlier context than the one in which we now teach and practice and learn about architecture. This was arguably an era of closed system thinking. For instance, it was in this period that the split between the Beaux-Arts and the Polytechnic in France was codified, instituted, and then imported to North America as the primary basis of architectural education on this continent. As a closed model, design could be and was separated from techniques, which in turn could be separated from history and politics. But we, of course, live in a very different world that is quite different than the 19th century origins of our North American Beaux-Arts model. Our world is inordinately more complex and it is constitutively open. In the face of mounting obligations and op opportunities for design um, and quite curious capabilities and culpabilities of design today, the derivation of closed models um, for architecture in this earlier period is at least worthy of our attention, if not an outright and radical reckoning. The ways in which we reason and imagine architecture through this inherited model relies too far heavily on a world that no longer exists or perhaps never did exist. For example, especially in the academy, this closed model of architecture has engendered a sustained fake debate and chronic false choice between design on one hand and the techniques of architecture on the other. In other words, this fake pedagogical debate routinely and reductively demands that we choose between equally deterministic claims of autonomy on one hand and claims of autarky on the other. 
Both tribes uh, of this, uh, both sides and tribes of this debate agree to disagree through this separation. In my view, this fake debate is both boring and wrong. And I can tell you that you can be boring and you can be wrong, but you should never be boring and wrong. This fake debate is wrong and boring because it, is, it routinely only offers us closed system models of discourse and technique for architecture in a constitutively open system world. So although we are trained to, uh, too often trained to assume that buildings are isolated objects and isolated acts of design and techniques, the reality is that the formation of techniques of architecture is, an op uh, is based on open systems. Uh, and reflects intense pulses of matter and energy across a range of temporal and spatial scales. In my view, this demands core knowledge of open system dynamics. And when I say open systems, I mean that the, the political, philosophical, scientific, formal, historical, social, and ecological conditions that presuppose any building all would benefit from a more open model of what architecture is, how we produce it, and its potentials in this century. So to conceptualize architecture and its pedagogy as open systems would help address my prevailing response to my host's prompt, which is that we ought to stop making the future a colony of present pedagogies and practices. To help us do that, I have a few provisional uh, set of observations and notes. Uh, the first is that we need an entirely different literacy about energy and architecture, because energy, more than any other topic, teaches us the most about open system dynamics. Second, I think we could instill an ethics of care and repair in our pedagogy and practices. And if one engages these first two points, then I think you inevitably begin to shape a non-modern set of design pedagogies and practices for architecture in this century. Regarding my first point, um, if we are ever to understand the dynamics of open systems, we need a much more evolved vocabulary for our energetics and how each of these concepts relate to one another. Thus, a fundamental part of this basic literacy is dropping the prevailing quackery about energy efficiency, energy conservation, passive house techniques, and net zero energy buildings. None of these concepts are any more scientifically or architecturally cogent than the others, and I believe that these errant concepts have systematically de-skilled architects and blunted their curiosity about what the role and potential of the energetics of architecture and urbanization might be. A more intricate and precise vocabulary about energetics would lead to more consequential system boundary definitions in architecture. Indeed, whenever an architect wants to speak to me about energy, my first and often only question for them is what is your system boundary and why? This is arguably the most thermodynamically and politically consequential act of design, but the least considered in architecture today. Once the very serious and complex topic of system boundary definition as in your mind, then the next test should be determine the relative orders of magnitude involved in any system or building project, and we should, without bias, work on the right orders of magnitude of energy involved in that project. Because architects are trained to think of buildings as isolated systems, we have tended to focus on operational efficiencies as the relevant system boundary. And while some more recent forms of analysis have extended the system boundary, um, even these, though, um, treat the world as an infinite reserve of matter and energy because they do not go far enough to include all the biogeophysical inputs that constitute a building. Energy is the only uh, methodology and approach that does not treat the world as an infinite reserve. In other words, uh, in terms of method, I cannot externalize the energy required for the growth of a tree from, one of the, from the wood that I use uh, to build, operate, heat, and maintain any of the timber buildings that I might design and build as an architect. This is important not only for the, um, to address the met metabolic rift of our current energetics in, in our discipline and in our society, but it is equally critical uh, for how we construe the formation of architecture as well as its politics. So for a slightly more detailed example, but brief example, um, my colleague Ravi and I included an unusually thorough energy evaluation uh, in our book on the hierarchy of, of energy. Our focus was the assessment of an otherwise unremarkable building, uh, which is Brinker Hall here that you see, uh, which is a lead school of construction management at the University of Florida. When the system boundary is expanded to reflect the actual constitution of the building, and thus tracks all of its energetic inputs, throughputs, and outputs, 
and we tabulate the rather ponderous numbers involved, we can finally place the systems in their proper hierarchy and thus begin to discern which orders of magnitude of energy are more or less consequential uh, in this uh, emblematic building project. And when you aggregate material energy versus operational energy, it is apparent that most of the energy associated with building is related to construction and maintenance, about 80% of the total energy associated with architecture. This, of course, raises questions uh, about the unsubstantiated preoccupation with operational energy efficiencies in architecture and its highly deterministic impositions on how we design and teach architecture. So once we understand this uh, hierarchy of energy in architecture and the respective of orders of magnitude involved, we can then start to more meaningful, meaningfully maximize the ecological and architectural power of design. And we can thereby thus maximize the production of entropy uh, from a design and thus thereby begin to finally maximize the environmental impact of architecture and normalization through design. In other words, doing less bad, as we've been doing for the last couple decades, is not the same thing as doing something ecologically and architecturally powerful that will ultimately help us design present and future states that are based on the abundance of energy in our world, its potential exuberance, and its latent architectural vitality. In short, there's an enormous uh, educational project regarding the epistemological and methodological limitations of present dogmas regarding energy and architecture, and thus, um, that, you know, and these dogmas uh, which continue to make the future a colony of our present pedagogy. Uh, regarding my second claim, which is about an ethics of care and repair in our open system world, uh, this is Toronto and Fisher's definition, which they describe care as a species of activity that includes everything we do to maintain, contain, and repair our world so that we can live at it as well as possible. That world includes our bodies, ourselves, and our environments. Um, there's a lot to say on this topic, um, but I'm going to simply observe, um, as John noted, that I learned more about architecture in the months that I served as a custodian at the Salk Institute when I was there as an undergraduate co-op student than in any other job or academic endeavor I've experienced thereafter. If we take care and repair seriously, then in a gush of goodwill, we might finally recognize that to invent the ship is to invent the shipwreck. And thus we might begin to accept erosion, breakdown, decay, and failure as one basis of design rather than the early modernist and neoliberal indicators of problem solving, growth, innovation, fixing, and progress as unquestioned starting points and endpoints of design. As a key uh, part of open system thinking, care and repair extends architectural concern beyond the completion of construction and methodologically engages the future in ways that may preclude its colonization by the present. These first two points help set in a non-modern intellectual orientation to my host prompt, but it has not revealed much about design. So I'd like to take a, uh, my last couple of minutes to focus on how design fits into this perspective. In this regard, I think there's nothing more clarifying and transformative than to introduce be uh, beginning design students to the extensive and intensive properties of architecture. Extensive properties such as mass, volume, weight, and length are proportional to the amount of material in the system. These are the tr traditional variables of design, and the formal virtuosity of design today remains almost exclusively focused on the modulation of extensive and static properties of architecture. Intensive properties such as temperature, pressure, and color are not proportional to the amount of material in the system, and thus introduce degrees of freedom for transformation and the possibilities of emergent states within the same architecture. Intensive uh, propensities enliven buildings by activating duration and all the energetic gradients, material assemblages, and most importantly, uh, much more of the politics related to building. The extensive and intensive attributes of architecture are neither binary properties, nor do they engender binary readings of architecture. As a designer and studio instructor, I'm committed to the reciprocities between the extensive and intensive possibilities of architecture. And to provide uh, a simple example, um, one of the exercises I teach in my studio is a, is a short uh, three-week exercise focused on this type of composition. Uh, so this, in this case, this is a, a first semester MRC student without an architecture background, um, and she considered concrete and its inherent mixture of structural and thermal capacities. So more dense concrete can span further, um, and it is more conductive, while lightweight aerated concrete can span less far, requires more bearing area, and is less conductive. Um, and the initial prompt uh, in this assignment is 
to generate uh, even arbitrary mixing of densities and fairly abstract patterns and begin to understand their potential structural implications uh, of those patterns. Um, and this helps uh, a beginning design student uh, discern the associated architectural possibilities and to produce, in this case, uh, a tower that exhibits an unexpected but consistent set of varied spatial, structural, and thermal relationships uh, as the basis of its composition. I see this as a quite accomplished project from a first semester student uh, with a non-architecture background um, that in my mind could not have been produced otherwise in such a short period. Um, the design brief for this project cultivates non-reductive ways to think thermodynamically about formation as well as to think about the latent formal propensities um, in thermodynamics itself. Um, it's, it's an exercise that offers students a sense of what Karl Popper characterized as plastic control, um, which, and this is a, a kind of modality of thought and design that is uh, directly applicable to a project, but it is also more emblematic of how one might engage open system thinking more, uh, more generally and more intellectually. The project implores first semester students and faculty alike to treat matter, energy, and form in ways that eclipse technocratic and deterministic paradigms that we've inherited. Likewise, they must also think beyond the prevalent styles of formal reasoning that overtly uh, and too often sever architecture from not only its material uh, and energetic propensities, but its political dimensions as well. Another key aspect of uh, studio pedagogy for me is the topic of co coordination or the frames of reference that we use to produce art architectural artifacts and phenomena. Cartesian description, our traditional, if not parochial, system of coordination, could only recognize fixed objects within fixed frames of reference. Uh, architects remain unwittingly and inexplicably preoccupied with the fetters of Cartesian coordination in which no change can occur. This continues to impose basic epistemological and methodological limitations on design, as well as our politics. Cartesian description is like a photograph of a kayaker, frozen in a river taken from a fixed point on a river bank. Locked within the limits of Cartesian coordinates, architects can rarely imagine architecture coordinated otherwise. Other frames of reference, such as Eulerian coordination, acknowledge the inevitable dynamics of time and flow. Yet this model of coordination only describes how energy and matter move in reference to a fixed boundary. This accounts for flow, but does not reveal much about formation. This is like watching the kinematics of the kayaker, but still is a fixed observer on the shore. Although it acknowledges flow, it does not it is not sufficient to coordinate the manifold movements of architecture and thereby acknowledge what Heraclitus long ago observed, that all things move and nothing remains still. To not fully accept this precept takes all the fun and a lot of the potential function out of the flow and formation. So a third model, Lagrangian coordination, is important in my work because architecture inherently involves manifold movements. In the Lagrangian model, you are the kayaker and submit to the ecstasy of flow. All qualities and quantities of the surrounding domain are gauged relative to the moving subject. Any event, sensation, or formation that emerges in a flow field is coordinated relative to these compound movements. In Lagrangian coordination, flow field behavior is described by following a set of material points through time and space. As such, it describes the emergent figures, forms, and transformations that come to appear in the process. This type of morphological description has very important but totally unconsidered and spatial and temporal implications for our understanding of form and formation. All three of these models of coordination are relevant to my approach to design and open systems thinking, but none um, are taken for granted. So to sum up, um, in my own teaching, research, and design work, uh, there are a few primary points about architecture in an age of open systems. Um, Today, today, I think energy, care, and other aspects of non-modern design are all important ways to question the canon today um, and help indicate what architectural, might, what architectural education might do today and how it could evolve in this century given all of its possibilities and potential brutalities. Uh, thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Anne and John, for inviting me to be here tonight and kill. It's a pleasure. I look forward to discussing it afterwards. Um, so I, I'm not going to show any front work uh, in a quick kind of pre-discussion. We talked about ultimately um, 
while this question is complex and it has a lot of layers to it, for me, I guess the only thing I really want to speak to is the question about architectural education and what can be done within that context. I like the question about like, what is the obligation? Is there any obligation? Um, for me, I don't have a particularly well-formed opinion about it. Um, so, you know, we either steward the environment or we don't. Like, it's a narcissistic question. We either shepherd the world for our own benefit and that of the uh, diverse world within which we live, or we go all to hell in a handbasket, right? I mean, make a choice. Um, right now, it's not looking that great. So what I wanted to talk about is um, just my time at Georgia Tech. Um, the, uh, do you mind, can we turn a light on? Is there somebody up there who could turn a light on? Ah, great, thanks, sorry. Because I can't see anything, except for Keel. That's why I'm just looking at him. Uh, uh, so uh, when, when I got invited to come down to Georgia Tech to do this bench lit chair thing, it's strictly a teaching position, but it's like fall and spring for five years. And uh, you have to make a pitch, and it wasn't obvious for me that I should be doing this. Hey, Rick. Um, then we, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the simple question was like, okay, I'm going to propose studios as process and method, and what is the role of mock-ups and prototypes in a kind of iterative process as both hypothesis as also empirical kind of evidence and testing in order to build confidence to build something that is real. Um, everyone's like, oh, that's great, and I showed them like 50 mock-ups, and they're like, sold, okay. But actually, I just wanted to do like full design studios, because I wasn't doing that at Princeton. So, um, but for me, uh, I guess in the end, um, joining them is, is me spending time with like 10 to 12 students, and what is that relationship and why me? And I know I have a particularly kind of uh, distinctive sort of, um, uh, kinds of experience which aren't normal like facade engineering and so forth like you know I'm not I'm not uh, I never set out to be a facade engineer um, just kind of things evolve but there's a combination of uh, in my case really a very extensive travel traveled a lot uh, it took 12 years to get through Waterloo um, uh, of which probably nine years was travel uh, in between that period um, so uh, for me, in a way, Waterloo, uh, you know, was kind of interwoven with the rest of practice and life and experience. And, and in the end, it's, you know, the, the, the uh, evolution into teaching is kind of uh, just part of that trajectory. Um, but I, I really, really always enjoyed practice. I really enjoyed uh, the kind of existential pleasure of getting things built. Uh, and I think I've been fortunate that even in my kind of apprenticeship roles and then young architect, and then consulting roles, and then in practice, we've had a kind of pretty amazing run of getting stuff built. And that experience of uh, construction sites, and factories, and meetings, and testing, all kind of conflates to, to you know, like a pressure cooker, to accelerate one's appreciation of all of the kind of more formal and esoteric issues, and architectural history issues, and urbanism, and politics that we have to engage in. And so I, I set the studios up to be almost entirely without um, any kind of particular agenda. And being not uh, an authored architect myself, I have no place to be offering formalism-based studios. That's not obviously what I'm there for. Uh, so it, it evolved in a manner where there'd be me, let's just say 12 students. Um, and the only thing that I, I could do is I'd say, okay, well, Tom Ventilette's endowment is giving us 50,000 bucks a semester, and we're gonna spend half of it on travel, and we're gonna spend half of it on mock-ups and models. So let's go. And by the way, if you don't come up with anything good enough to build as a mock-up, we're not gonna spend the money. We'll just save it and put it into the next semester. That's the biggest threat. And so they, um, it's like, where do you wanna go? And they're, you know, it's like, you know, eventually I had to plan it, but in, initially it was like, okay, we're gonna go to Mexico City and then New York and Toronto, and then eventually, uh, you know, Istanbul, Paris, Moscow, Sao Paulo, Hong Kong, Seoul. You know, it was like a really good five years doing two weeks of travel every semester. Um, and uh, what I would do is not create a program. 
be like, okay, so we're just going to talk. What are you all interested in? What are your key primary goals in architectural education? What are you here? What are your values? Uh, do you have a social equity agenda? Are you interested in environment stewardship? Right? Are you uh, you give a shit? You want to basically do kind of like you know formalist, uh, crazy nutso geometry stuff? Like what what do you want to do? What are you guys about? And you know grad students at Georgia Tech are a pretty interesting bunch. A few of them are from the region. Um, a lot of them are from South America, Turkey, you know, a few other places. Uh, different mix from Princeton. Um, and and then we just kind of go with it. And one, one studio ended up being a refugee center in Paris, which I didn't set as the agenda, but it actually ended up being an incredibly deep, profound experience. And actually visiting, you know, refugee centers at the cusp of the kind of beginning of the event in that year. Uh, and then we did a kind of adaptive reuse refugee um, uh, welcome center for 2,500 people in part of the uh, Reinventer Paris program. Uh, we crash landed on the Sully Marlon project, which we knew inevitably David Chipperfield would turn into a five-star hotel. Um, but we basically had a hypothesis about something that could be quite different. You know, we did an affordable housing project in Sao Paulo. It wasn't my agenda. We crash landed on Frank Gehry's mega project in downtown Toronto as a kind of critical process for something that was, for me, a kind of linchpin inversion of where Toronto was going, but in a kind of wholly inappropriate way. And so we, we had Greg Lintern from the city of Toronto as our kind of like mascot all the way along, uh, shepherding our kind of critical process in advance. It's quite interesting to see that their project changed. I won't say that we had any influence at all, um, but uh, other studios involved um, uh, like a kind of uh, academic arts education facility in Hong Kong, which coincided while we were there with the, um, with the large student protests during that particular year. And then we wove that whole uh, narrative and question about like, you know, um, uh, equity in the arts, you know, sponsorship of the arts, uh, Chinese policy relative to Hong Kong, freedom of speech, et cetera, et cetera, into the narrative of the program. But I did this entirely in a kind of Socratic way where you just basically kind of iteratively bring people out and help them develop the agenda. And then all projects are, by definition, multi-scalar. So they're inventing the program. They're choosing the site. They're choosing the study area, the loci of the site, and actually defining it. And they're also then um, uh, negotiating uh, you know, questions of uh, uh, urban design, building, uh, tectonics, materiality, all simultaneously. And by the way, they're working in a group without hierarchy. And there's no imposed hierarchy for me, which of course is not like practice. But you know, the best parts of practice are when the person with editorial control does actually allow the rest of the team to work in a manner that's bottom up. Rem does that. And it creates a kind of incredible amount of kind of energy that is often in conflict, but the best ideas emerge from anyone at whatever level of experience, and they percolate up. And so what I was, because I do so much kind of collaboration, working on hundreds of projects with maybe thousands of people, I think I've developed a kind of slightly unique perspective on uh, how people work and typologies of how people work. And I don't try to actually distill it, but I, I, I work in a, uh, a kind of reactive way as to uh, try and uh, shepherd the way through a process uh, and see what happens. So uh, the one I'm just going to show you now is uh, in Seoul. Um, and I had Seoul on my radar for a long time. We've done some work there uh, as a practice. Uh, my partner's originally from there. Um, and so when we set up Seoul, I basically, um, you know, just before we were going to go, I, I, I emailed John Hong, right, who was formerly at the GSD and now at Seoul National. And hey, John, it's like, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's meet up in Seoul for Korean fried chicken and beer, right? That's what you do. And he's like, oh, what are you coming over for? It's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do a studio in Dongdaemun. He's like, what, are you kidding me? You know, we're running like the uh, Seoul International Studios for the, for the um, Korean Biennale. And we're like, yeah? He's like, you want to do it? It's like, yeah, what are the constraints? It's like, well, you got to work in Dongdaemun. I was like, wow, well, we're there. All right. And so all of a sudden, we're into a... Uh, uh, an umbrella format here where we're going to be part of the Seoul International uh, Studios as part of the um, uh, Seoul Biennale. Um, so we went and the students uh, engaged the different seven neighborhoods of Dongdaemun. 
Uh, they engaged the, 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 the framework that was set up. And, and, I mean, the biggest narrative there is really it's the third largest uh, wholesale garment industry in, on the planet. And uh, there's like tens of thousands of jobs there. Um, and a lot of it is at risk of being displaced through gentrification. And so even though the Chungachun is a huge catalyst and DDP by Zaha is a huge catalyst, they're also catalysts in a way that can displace and destroy through gentrification. And you know, we're not there to basically, we can't resist it because those are the forces of money. But what we can do is we can theorize about what kind of building or institution or development would double down on reinforcing the economics and the values and the workflow of what's actually happening in that neighborhood as opposed to uh, displacing it. And it ends up being a kind of a highbrow project. And the, the, one, the most interesting thing is they, they, they educated themselves on the fly about the Seoul garment industry. And then one of our friends, uh, Song Hong Kim, who's um, at University of Seoul, made an introduction to Iwa University, uh, their fashion GSD there. And we met two of the top professors who graciously made a day for us. And they basically just downloaded the entire economic structure. And they said, we don't need another fashion school. We don't need another institution like that. We need an economic accelerator. We need something like, and this is their words, like uh, an MIT media lab for the Dongdaemun garment industry. And then the students said, okay, well, let's just start figuring out what that program looks like. And then they just, just like this kind of insane program of, of like changing, do we put a hotel in there? Do we put student residences? Do we put laboratories? Do we put this or with that? And after like so much work, the, the students distilled the project down into five and a half minutes. Can we turn the lights off?
So this question about the, the scale of these objects um, on the site, this plaza, the key thing is the, the heritage scale of the, um, of the Dongdaemun Gate itself. And uh, the, there's a series of low quality buildings from the first generation of post-war construction that happened on that site. And that eventually was, um, you know, we felt in the kind of debate of adaptive reuse, because we're, we're generally heavily on the side of preservation and adaptive reuse in a kind of an intelligent way. Um, but in this case, we thought the site actually needed something better. Um, also, the, the idea of doing a kind of architecture of the night, uh, an architecture of illumination, light as an architectural material, was something central to the students' interests and concerns. And of course, um, they overlaid onto this the idea that this this lab, which kind of in a way is hyper-private and in a way concealed, uh, is also communicative and beautiful. And it's this thing that basically plays onto the, the kind of landscape. Um, and so they were very interested in this question about what is the, uh, sorry, uh, the facade itself. And so um, we all know that, you know, glass block, of course, is, doesn't, have, doesn't have very good thermal value. So the whole thing is actually designed as a kind of frameless interior, triple glazed glass wall with a thermally ventilated cavity, uh, very high on the embodied energy scale, but from an energy standpoint, works very well, provides the kind of privacy. Um, uh, and we also then speculate on how to turn this into something, you know, that, that the materiality of the glass blocks and the masonry actually uh, was in a dialogue with the masonry of the, of the, of the gate, which for them became very important. Uh, but then the kind of uh, engaging the Dong De Mon design plaza and the adjacent buildings in terms of a kind of a, a soft communicative capability became something really important. Um, and so working with scales, as you saw there, there's a kind of site building scale, there's a building uh, model scale, both of them were made out of subtractively milled corion and then uh, which we use as a projection surface. And the, the projection technique was really at its kind of like infancy in even where we got to because the students just don't have the capability to do storyboarded, timed, curated, you know, content. It's actually an incredible industry, of course, as we all know, to generate media content for an architectural armature. But they chose to both try to convey the story in five minutes in model, with illumination and projection with images and text content to a kind of cadence that was legible. And I think they succeeded. Uh, and then on top of it, there was a mock-up. And the mock-up, we couldn't do it in Seoul, and there wasn't enough time. So um, uh, Scott Marble, who's the current chair of the School of Architecture in Atlanta, said, can you build your little prototype as a kind of permanent installation within the School of Architecture? So what you're looking at here is a drawing the students made, um, which is the, the shop, shop drawings essentially for the mold, for the custom cast glass that they were going to make. And if you look at the drawing at the bottom, the plan, they, they did some tweaks. Basically, it's a post-tension cast glass block wall, of which there's a few precedents. There's a beautiful one in uh, Hiroshima, private residence. It's just gorgeous. But they wanted to do something a little bit different. So they found a way to actually kind of stagger the blocks in plan and they're 8 inches, 12 inches, and 16 inches with a kind of interlace pattern where they also are slightly rotated a few degrees. But you can see the post-tension cable lines or the rod lines are actually a straight line every 4 inches on center following on the module. And then the exterior face of the cast glass is actually cantered outward a little bit. So it actually develops a double directional shingle. There's a shingle in plan and a shingle in section all through three glass blocks which are all made in one reconfigurable mold. And so every single glass block and all the geometry is generated through this one single mold. And so using our funds, we had um, them, we had a custom tooling CNC company actually fabricate uh, the mold to our drawings. And then uh, and deliver it to us. And we sent somebody out to Ohio to kind of help oversee that process. And then, so here's the, all the plans relative to the mock-up. And for the mock-up, we went with something quite modest. It's like seven feet wide by nine feet tall. But um, that itself is proven to be quite um, an enormous 
challenge. And then here are some images uh, along the way of the uh, tooling steel. But I'll, I'll jump into some more detailed ones here. So you can see firsthand, this is the mold, and those are the release pins that create the kind of holes in the cast glass where the threaded tension rods go through, and each glass block is individually supported, kind of like, you know, Renzo Piano's uh, Urcan building in Paris with the terracotta sleeved onto uh, tension rods. And then this kind of plug here is basically how we kind of reconfigure the 8-inch, 12-inch, and 16-inch blocks as they're cast. And so some early samples for our final review, we had three blocks made. Of course, the mock-up work has largely progressed. And you can immediately, the students, like the visceral kind of reaction to, oh my God, like there's no dimensional uh, uniformity here. How do we actually control the amount of, uh, you know, molten glass that's actually going into this thing? And then to release it, and I was saying, well, that's where Mary Oxman's 3D printed glass deposition comes into play into a mold. She doesn't want to do that yet, but we're going to try and convince her. Um, by the way, we, we did have a kind of a hour and a half uh, WebEx session with Neri Oxman during this process to kind of speculate about how it could be developed and so forth. And then we worked with a local glass artist in Atlanta uh, who actually then started making them. Um, in addition, we wanted to put the uh, LED low-res video array behind it and to start understanding how that might actually look, uh, where do you put them, what is the kind of optical effect, is it actually something we like or not, and, and what, what is the kind of ultimately, uh, how do we program content for this that is actually meaningful and interesting. Um, and we're only starting to get there now. So we're about 70%, maybe 60% finished, including all the steel framing and the tensioning, the engineering and the post drilling of anchors to this lab and getting permission. We're probably about 90% done. Um, but, um, you know, the thing about cast glass, of course, it's like water, it's just, it's like beautiful, exquisite, no matter what you do. But from a pedagogical standpoint, the kind of internalized learning that the student group got to get to this kind of like, you know, point of engineered systems and materials, uh, this is, you know, it gives them a kind of incredible level of uh, confidence, um, you know, and, and understanding of what they can do moving forward. And so for each studio, we built a large scale mock up as well and all of them just get kind of destroyed. We did an architectural concrete cast facade and we did um, a large scale uh, bamboo grid shell structure with infilled ETFE pillows when we got support from Bird Air to make that. And what's also interesting is like trying to actually get support from industry in real time during a studio when you actually don't know what your building is yet. So I had these kind of like really accelerated design timelines where in like six to eight weeks, they'd have to start speculating on what it is they want to make. And then of course, with my kind of industry network, I just call on certain favors like, hey, you know, Krista Curva, can you get us a piece of double curve glass in three weeks? You know, and then they would, they would do it. Um, one time we had uh, this crazy kind of uh, trapezoidal um, glass, uh, black glass mock-up, which um, all the glass and the air freight was donated by one of our friends in, in China. So they essentially gave us about $50,000 worth of glass, which they made in about two weeks and then air freighted over. And we actually got it on the mock-up within the constraints of the semester. So let me just check. Well, I don't think that's going to work. Well, that's working, amazing. So this is obviously pretty crude and not what I would necessarily recommend aesthetically, but uh, they're just running uh, some tests to start seeing what it would look like. And as you can see now, the, the LED, LEDs are embedded in horizontal lines behind the joint. They're at a very specific angle facing up, which gives kind of like the maximum sort of uh, legibility of, of the kind of blockiness without kind of localized LED highlights. Um, and it's, it's gotten to a point where, you know, the combination is pretty amazing. We, we also acknowledge like precedents like the, the installation in, in Millennium Park in Chicago with the beautiful glass blocks, you know, with the kind of LED array. Okay. So with that, I think you get the point. I'm done. Thank you.